thank you all for joining us. My name is Becca Warwick and I'm an intern with the Montana World Affairs Council and we are excited to have you all with us. Before I introduce our guest, I would like to thank the Council and the Classroom sponsors, the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, the BNSF Railway Foundation, First Security Bank, and Trail West Bank. Dr. David Western is chairman of the African Conservation Center. He began research in the Savannah ecosystems at Mboseli in 1967, looking at, the at looking at the interactions of humans and wildlife. His work has served solutions based on the coexistence of people and wildlife. I will now turn it over to Dr. Western. Thank you. So I'm going to start by asking whether any of you know a Swahili word. Who knows any Swahili word? I'll have you unmute your microphone for this one. If anybody knows a Swahili word, go ahead, unmute your microphone, and call it out. Who has seen Lion King? Oh, I'm seeing some hands raised. Absolutely. Yep. Give me one Swahili word you know. <laughs> okay, I can see a hand there. All right, Mrs. Homegun's class. Nothing's coming on. I think they're still muted. Yes. Yes. There you are. Okay. Um, who is it? Anthony, tell her what the tell him what the Swahili word is, please. Sorry, I forgot it now. Oh. Uh, that's uh... <laughs> From Lion King. I just forgot now. Senpai? Uh, tell him. Tell him. Senpai? Senpai? Simba. Simba means lion in Swahili. Ooh! Asante. Asante means thank you in Swahili. So how about the word safari? Safari? How about the word safari? You might think it's an English word, but it's not. It's actually a Swahili word, which means to travel. It's become a universal word because in East Africa, everyone travels. And it's not just about travel to see wildlife. It's about travel of any sort. So going back to Lion King, how about Hakuna Matata? Hakuna Matata. There's a hand going up. Say it, say it. Say it. Hakuna Matata. Hakuna Matata? Tell them. Matata. 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 I forgot what it meant. Did you sing the song? Happy? Do you remember this, how the song goes? No worries. Akuna Matata means no worries. No worries. Great. No troubles. That's Akuna Matata. Okay, so I, I'm going to I'm going to try and locate you back in East Africa where I come from, because I'm from Kenya. I was the head of the National Park Service many years. But to me, what was most important is this big question, which actually you might ask of Montana as well. Why do you in Montana have so much wildlife, where most of the other states in the US have lost theirs? So having grown up in Tanzania, I asked that very same question of Kenya. How come we have the richest wildlife on Earth? How come that people and wildlife have managed to coexist over all these many, many years? So as a young person, when I was doing my graduate studies, I went to an area called Amboseli, which is that wonderful scene where you see Kilimanjaro in the background and elephants and giraffe in the foreground and so on. And I said, how come we have so much wildlife, but we even have more livestock? And people and wildlife have lived in East Africa together, livestock and wildlife, for over 4,000 years. So what is so special that people can coexist with wildlife where most other places it disappears. So I had a very special experience. Instead of just flying in my plane and counting animals and doing all the things that scientists normally do, I was asked why one particular Maasai herder, those people who wear the wonderful red dresses, if you want to understand Amboseli, you have to see Amboseli through the eyes of a cow. And I'm going to give you two cattle, one black and one white. And you have to herd those cattle all the way through the year. Only then will you understand what Amboseli means to us, and how we manage to exist with wildlife. So let me just give you that very brief story. There is no word in the Maasai language for conservation. Why? Because every single family depends on the cow, 
and the women have to milk those cows every single day to get sufficient milk to feed their families. And then in turn, they have to make sure the cow is in sufficiently good health to produce that milk. Then the next step is they have to make sure there's sufficient grazing to see those animals through the dry season. Now that link all the way through the chain from the welfare of your family to maintaining the rangelands in good condition in Maasai is called eramatere. And eramatere really is the complete linkage across the landscape. Where does wildlife come into it? They say that during good times, spare wildlife, because during bad times, you can use them as your second cattle when your own cattle begin to die off. And traditionally, the Maasai used to say, wildlife was the women's cattle. And the women didn't manage them very well, and they went onto the bush. So today, when we try and involve local people in conservation and tourism, we have to remind them that, hey guys, these are women's cattle. And therefore, women have to be part of the benefits from conservation as well. So I'm going to really enlarge this to a, a bigger question, which is going to face all of you within your lifetime, within the 21st century. How is it that for three to 4,000 years, the Maasai, along with wildlife, managed to exist and survive within the savannas and not overuse their resources? The very same question is going to face you in the 21st century. How do we go beyond the limits of living within a rangeland to sustaining the planet? Because in your lifetime, the planet's going to heat up, the ocean's going to get more acidic, we're going to see more plastic in the oceans. So your problem is this. How do you make sure, not just that it's sufficient for you to live on, but you have a quality of life which you all aspire to, that you can go out and see the great bison herds, up in the northern reserve. You can go and see grizzlies, the bears, and more than that, you can go to Sydney and see the Opera House. You can go to Europe and you can see the great, great cultural things. That is what we have to do in the 21st century, to conserve the environment and to conserve diversity. And so the question I'm gonna ask you at the end is what role do you have as this younger generation into whose hands we're placing the problems we've created that you're going to solve them. So I just want to step back one moment and try and connect up Kenya and Montana. The Maasai are coming out of a long-term subsistence way of life. They're moving into a global economy and they're asking, how can we preserve our rangelands? How can we make sure we don't destroy those rangelands? Now the ranchers and the cowboys in North America have been through the same thing over about 150 years. And particularly in the Southwest, they've destroyed their grasslands, they've destroyed their rangelands and so on. And now they're coming together as much larger coalitions, like the Blackfoot Challenge just up the road here, and saying, let's conserve our rangelands. Let's make sure that there is a life and a livelihood for our children beyond us. So we've got together ranchers from North America, together with the Maasai in East Africa, and we've exchanged views. We've got the Maasai into the Malpai in the southwest. We put them on horses with the cowboys. And they've gone out on the rangeland and says, how is it that the ranchers have subdivided their land, they've degraded the land, and now they're restoring it? We in East Africa think we have the solutions for restoration by forming these large social coalitions among the Maasai. Likewise, we the Maasai feel we're going to learn from you in North America because you did go through a hundred years of land subdivision, degradation of the land, and now you're restoring it. So I want to make the point that it's the exchange around the world of these very different views of people who are in very different positions, which I see as a way of bridging connections. So my question for you is, here we are in a global world. You know that the impact that you have when you buy a particular product in a supermarket can be damaging to people in Asia, the sweatshops there, poor health, poor facilities, and so forth. How can you make sure, like the Maasai, that when you milk your cow, or in other words, you buy a product in the supermarket, the impact which you're creating globally has been contained, and you can contain it? How are you going to do that? Hmm. It's a really good spot to, to pause for a second. 
and get some input from some of our schools. I see that we have Bo Bozeman is just joining joining us, and so um, I think I'm actually going to have you repeat the question in just a minute or two right. after they have all sat down, so then they can be thinking about this as well. But I'm wondering, uh, Chinook, are you with us today? Oh, you don't see them on. Um, yep. Dixon, I know, is, is having some technical issues and is going to, I believe, um, type their, their questions to us. So we'll... Okay. Yeah. Dixon, could you unmute your microphone? This will be a good sound check. Yes. Hello, this is Dixon. Um, I have oh, good. a couple of sci-fi younger students here. Um, so we will be hopefully coming up with some questions as we go. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Um, how about Florence Carlton? Are you able to unmute your microphones? And Florence Carlton, if you are um, having issues with your microphone, I know that yesterday there were some technical troubles, you can email um, Kathleen, Kathleen at inspiredclassroom.com any questions and we will relay those to her. So let's go ahead to um, Cut Bank. Take care of her animals, wild animals, and pick up more trash. <laughs> what did we talk about research? Who remembers? Tatum? I I Samson. That you can have the fish and see where the animals came from. Okay, good. Stand up and tell him that. Tell him what you, you've discovered. Stand up. No. Well, just say it loud enough so he can hear you. Because the, we want to hear you. Okay. Okay, go ahead. The animals, like, like um, you know how, like, people, like, fish and eat the food? Yeah. Like, that comes from different countries and makes, like, it hurts people's feelings that you're eating other countries' foods and... Yeah. I don't know. So be careful where you get your fish from. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and, um, Dr. Western, would you go ahead and repeat the question for our Bozeman, because we have our Bozeman students there now, and I, they've been sort of listening, so I think they, if you would repeat the Yes, question. I mean, yes. the example I gave, this is for Bozeman, is that if you look at traditional people like the Maasai, they have to depend on the cattle, the family depends on the, on the cattle, so they have to maintain the health of the cattle. Likewise, to maintain the health of the cattle, they have to maintain the grasslands on which they depend to make sure they don't die in droughts and so on. So there's a very close feedback between the child and the resource, the pasture. In this global world, when you go into a supermarket, you're buying various things and you don't know where they come from. You don't know what impact they have socially on people in sweatshops in Asia. You don't know what impact they have on the environment by trash and so on and so forth. So I'm asking particularly the younger generation who are really socially connected by smartphones, by the World Wide Web, how you can use that social connectivity that you've developed so uniquely to link up and find out how you can do the same as the Maasai in the global world. In other words, make sure that the things you buy, the things you consume, do not have an impact on other people or the environment. That's my question. All right, Bozeman. Go ahead if you have a response. <laughs> Debating it. They're debating. They're thinking. <laughs> yeah. While Bozeman is debating and thinking, Dixon just emailed us and was really curious. How, what, what type of credentials do you need to do this type of work? What kind of schooling did you have? How did you get involved in this? Because this is very, yeah, very interesting to those students. You know, most people who are involved in wildlife conservation have a passion, and I grew up hunting in Tanzania. My father was a hunter, I grew up on the elephant trail, and we would spend days at a time tracking elephants and so on and so forth. One day when I was eight years old, I dropped behind the rest of the crew, and I was approached by this huge weight antelope, it's called a sable antelope, and it was about twice the size that I am. And because I was a little human being, not a big one, and I wasn't threatening to it, it came right up to me from about 
less than five yards away and looked at me for several seconds. And I was very impressed for the first time ever that this wild animal was something like us. It had emotions, it had a sense. That totally transformed me. I decided from then on, I didn't give up hunting for a while, I was going to conserve animals because of that personal connection between them. And so I went on to ask this bigger question that I asked you early on. How do we find a place for pe people living with wildlife? So I went on to get a degree in zoology, but that wasn't the important thing. I then went back to these areas where I began my research, and yes, I did all the scientific things like count animals from plains and monitor grasses on the ground, but the point I made earlier on was the key one. The Maasai said, have cattle, we'll give you cattle, and by herding the cattle, you will understand how you have to live with that environment. So I both have a scientific education, but the most important one for me, and I think it's the most important one for everyone in this day and age, is to go back to the areas where people are producing your food, they're producing the things you're using, and ask of them this very same question. How do you make sure that your purchases, your buying, benefits them, and doesn't harm them. So good scientific education, good even more so that you go back on the ground and find out how people are living and how they're doing and how they're being affected. Thank you, and I just wanna say a welcome to Chinook, they just popped on. And I also have a response from Florence Carlton and then I'm coming to you, Bozeman, right after this. So uh, Florence Carlton says that they're here and they're really sorry that but their microphone and camera technology is, is out today. Yeah, yeah. But they're just starting to learn about the follow the frog label um, that can be found on products. It's a symbol from the Rainforest Alliance that signifies that the product has been sustainably harvested and produced. So that would be one way to make sure that Excellent. products. So thank you, Florence Carlton. Um, and then Bozeman, your turn. We're gonna have to unmute you. We can't hear you. <laughs> I know. Okay, we're here. We're here, Allie. <laughs> oh, this is Alder Drake. Hello. <laughs> Hi. We're we're being shy today. I don't know why, but. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. That's Parker. Sit right in the front. Um, I think you could spend your life kind of committed to any one of these like industries. Like you could follow. Uh, where your clothes come from or where I mean even as specific to like where bananas come from you could probably devote your whole career into like helping I don't know make the banana industry like better just well Rounded in general like I don't know there's too many issues in like a first world society like I couldn't Make sure that my shoes are being sourced like you know, I don't know what the right way like slavery free I guess like um there's just too much, the industries are too big and too widespread across the world for any like individual person to make an impact across everything. But I think anybody, and if we kind of get the ideas widespread, like if everyone in our society had read the Kelsey Tim Merman books so of where am I eating and where am I wearing, it would help like spread the information because I think most people in the society don't even care or know. But I also think that the problem so to say is just so big in general that like one individual person like you can't really do much about it like you have to kind of narrow your thoughts down to focus on one specific industry rather than where does everything I use come from because it comes from everywhere uh, let me respond to that by giving a very good example from Montana of why the impossible is impossible back in the 1920s and the 1930s the states were paying a bounty to eliminate the bear and the wolf and the other animals. Correct? There were no wolves left. The wolf had been reintroduced to Yellowstone. It's coming back all across the northern parts of the United States. To me, that was an impossible dream a while ago. But here's where, to me, it's been very important to connect action and consequence. In Kenya, 50 years ago, we started an organization called the Wildlife Clubs of Kenya. Now, you've seen Lion King, you've seen Lion at least on the silver screen. Most Kenyans have never seen a lion at all, 80% of them, their own wildlife. So the Wildlife Clubs of Kenya formed this club all over in 2,000 schools, 
And they made buses available, and they got them into the national parks, and they saw wildlife close up for the first time. And rather like that sable I was telling you about that really turned me on, that's what's happened to kids all over Kenya. They have really been fired up by first-hand contact with wildlife. And that's what's happened in the U.S. too. As you become increasingly urban, you have the time, you have the facility, you have the sensibility, if you like, to go back and look at wildlife in the land. Meanwhile, here are your ranchers who are having to face things like bison, which can which contribute brucellosis and others. So you've got two societies at once. One which is for reintroducing the wolf and the other not. And what I see is a huge change in sensibility. So let me bring it back to how you buy it. One of you gave a very good answer. You said the Rainforest Alliance, the frog, follow the frog. Well, there's a whole network around the world today called certification. And that means that every single product which is being used, whether it's coffee, whether it's fish in various areas, has to be certified to say this is sustainable. And all the big organizations like Walmart and so on and so forth <clears throat> are having to respond to you, the buyer, on whether or not you're going to buy that product because it's sustainable or it's not sustainable. So although you think it's a huge, great problem, really the power lies with you, the 8 million people on Earth who are purchasing things from the market. The second thing is fair trade. Does that trade really affect people in the sweatshops? As we saw in Bangladesh a few years ago when something like 200 people died in a substandard building which collapsed. And again, it had a huge effect in America. When that came out on the media, Americans stopped buying those products for a while. And that's where you feed back through the chain. So I'm going to pose another question to you. As a professional conservationist, I had enormous difficulty getting my message out on a worldwide basis. I had to go to lectures here in the US, I had to write books, had a very limited audience. Today, you have this smartphone. You can connect up with a canyon on the ground. And let me give you one very good example. There was a Maasai in Amboseli who was very traditional. He educated one of his sons who went to Switzerland into hosp hospitality management. He ended up here in Aspen, Colorado in the hospitality industry, ready to go back and train his own community in how to manage tourism and how to invite you over to East Africa and to enjoy wildlife and in turn keep it. This is what the smartphone does. It's your way of communication. We, the older generation, completely lack that. So again is, how do you think you can use this smartphone, the web, to really reconnect your action the impact you have, and the consequence it has. Certification is a very good answer, but is there more to it than that? Hmm. What about shaming? What about shaming? In a small community, particularly in areas like Montana, East Africa, and so on, if something does, they do something wrong, the community shames that person, and it has a very big emotional effect. And so in many ways, in our global world today, what, we've lacked, it, it, what we lack is that connection and that shaming. So how can you pull out individuals who are destroying the environment, who are really using cheap labor to a bad effect and so on? How can you affect that? Hmm. All right, so let's think about that one for a minute. I'm going to have everybody just take a moment to turn and talk within your group to kind of unpack that question a little bit. Um, and then we're going to go through and we'll hear some responses. So let's okay. go ahead and take um, maybe a minute to go ahead and discuss amongst your group. And then we will we'll listen to some responses. And then uh, Florence Carlton and Dixon, if you want to email, email me your response or Kathleen your response, um, we'll be waiting by. You already did. I know. I did one. Yes, you did. Oh, you did. <laughs> well, we've got we've go got cut bank ready to go. No. So go ahead, cut bank. How are you? Okay. All right. So, let's give you an answer. Why? Are you <laughs> <laughs> 
Go ahead, Anthony. But you already spoke. Who else wants to speak? Okay, Madison, go ahead. You can go on Facebook and text your friends. And, 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 tell, and you can call the cops. And you can call the cops. You gotta speak louder. You gotta speak louder. Okay, what were you gonna say about Facebook? It's okay. She doesn't have to look. Just say it. Say what you were gonna say. You could go on Facebook and do what? You could go on Facebook and text your friends and tell them don't kill animals. Yes, what else? You guys hike with the bears in the mountains, and what could you do about that? Go ahead, Tayden. Tell them don't kill bears? Well, you, you enjoy going to the park and walking around with the wildlife, right? Yeah. And you didn't, it didn't used to be like that, so what could, you, what could you do that could show the world how much you enjoy that? What about the pictures you take and the pictures you share? You post them? Yeah, you post them. <laughs> All right, That's wonderful. It. All right, let's let's go over to let's go over to Chinook. Hi, Chinook. Hi, Chinook. Hi, Chinook. Hi, Chinook. Hi. Um. Hola. 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 Yeah, Hola. 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 Um. You could, like, if you have, like, a large social media account, like, if you're on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever, you could send a picture or, like, share, um, share, like, stuff, like, ads and stuff for, like, maybe, like, a picture of an animal that says, like, these might not be here in a couple of years if you don't help conserve. Great. Thank you. Bozeman, would you like to add something? <laughs> Bozeman, I promise we won't bite. Allie, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, so comments that came out were uh, making things personal, like making personal connections via social media and then also uh, unfortunately or fortunately they said a lot of times they pay attention to more negative um, negative ads or, or negative things that are said on there. Mm. Good. And I haven't I haven't received anything yet from um, Dixon or Florence Carlton, but I will let us I will let you know if we do. So why don't you go okay. ahead and respond? Thank you. These are excellent responses. It, what, what you're doing, which I think is absolutely wonderful, is you're reconnecting yourself in a very personal way to the effect that you have on other people. And you're sending that on the web. You are shaming. You're saying, look, this person is doing the wrong thing. Obviously, there are other ways. For example, we know that elephants have been killed in very large numbers over the last 10 years. When we from Africa post pictures of elephants with their trunks cut off, with their tusks cut out, I mean, it really goes straight to people's feelings. And then they respond and say, we are not going to buy ivory because we know that buying ivory kills elephants. That's the sort of reconnection I mean. The web is very important, posting things online and so on. So let me just give you two very simple examples. I've been teaching a course at University of California, San Diego for the last 25 years. <coughs> Excuse me, and it's called Conservation and the Human Predicament. And I put to the undergrad students exactly the same question as you. I said, how can you give me an example of a difference you would make? And one of the kids came back with an example from Golden Gate, San Francisco. And there's trash all over the landscape. There are beer bottles here, and there are plastic cups from the uh, Starbucks over there, and so on. And it turns out that where they were dumping all the trash, there were no trash cans. The trash cans were entirely somewhere else. So they started taking pictures of all these different things that had been thrown out. Starbucks here and someone else there and Budweiser there and so on. And they posted it online. And it had a huge effect. Because on the one hand, those companies whose products were being trashed and thrown around felt really embarrassed. Secondly, the city council said, my goodness, we've got the trash cans in the wrong places. So they got together with the corporations and they decided, where should we be putting those trash cans? And by regularly posting 
all of this trash that had been thrown around, it very quickly cleaned up the trash in Golden Gate. That's one from North America. Let me give you another from East Africa. Here you are a herder. You're herding your cattle in late dry season. There's very little grass left and it's all in one place. And there are all these lions waiting there to kill your cattle. Now traditionally they would club together. They would take in larger numbers of people to protect their cattle. Again today what they're doing is they're going onto their cell phones because almost every single Maasai has a cell phone. And they're saying there's a lion over there. So why not club your cattle together and take them elsewhere? That means the conflict between lions and people has gone down to a very low level where they're using that smartphone to alert people to where the lions are. So on the one hand, it's saving the lions, and on the other hand, it's saving the livestock. So that means they're able to live together a lot more easily. So here again, it's connecting up really what you're doing and the effect it's having. You know, I'd, I'd like to give one example for that as well. Uh, we've been working with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Park, and they have a program with another organization, um, and they're looking at, at antelope right now, and what's happening is that antelope are being, or pronghorns are being caught in a lot of, are getting caught in fences, in the barbed wire fences, and they're trying to figure out, well, what can we do to prevent this? Because they're ultimately dying in these fences. And there's different solutions that could be created, um, ramps or um, pass-through gates that they could access. And they're using an app, it's the Antelope. And so it's an app that they're having students and ranchers and pretty much anyone in Montana download. And when they see Antelope crossing fence, you just hit a button and it shoots it off. And then they can start looking at where the most Antelope crossing fences and what can we do to target those particular areas in the state of Montana so that we have less antelope fatalities because of fences? Amazing. So it's okay. happening right at home, too, which it's, is it's all right. <laughs> kind of so, fun. So here's the challenge again, which I, I put at the beginning and I'll put again. Just as the Maasai over the last 3,000 years have had to live within the limits of their local area to make sure that their family survives and so on, during your lifetime, during the 21st century, you have the ultimate challenge of all human history. And that's how you're going to live within the limits of the planet. How you can control climate change, the acidification of the oceans. Look at all the plastic in the oceans at the moment. It's just horrendous. And really, even in areas like Lake Victoria, people are losing their living fishing because those fish are being suffocated by plastic. So that's the challenge as I see it. And it's going to go in many different directions. You've got to have enough food, and that means that you have to close the gap between the poor people living in the southern countries and yourself. So my second question is this. How can you make the rest of the world as wealthy, as able to enjoy a very rich life as the average American, without repeating exactly the same as America did in the early part of this century, was to pollute their environment to the point that you had an environmental movement that said, enough is enough. We cannot have more Beijings in the world where kids have to go to school with a face mask. So how can you, and this is particularly important for Americans, develop the means and develop the technology that allows the rest of the world to catch up with you and enjoy the same th benefits that you have without despoiling the environment. Mm -hmm. Now that's an enormous question, I know. But there's, someone said earlier, there's so many different ways of doing it, that just give me two or three examples. Mm -hmm. It's a big social question. America uses 24% of the resources worldwide, and it's only 5% of the world population. Why don't we take a minute and go ahead and discuss that? That is a big question. And let's have one group, or each group, come up with one suggestion. Okay. Well, each group will do one suggestion. And then what I'd like to do, um, if you'd like to respond, absolutely. But I'd like to hear some questions from the students to you in our last yeah. little bit of time okay. as well. 
So take a minute, discuss, and then we'll go. Th we'll we'll hear one one suggestion from each group. Immigrants. Yeah, immigrants. Immigrants. Yeah, no food or no bed. I will just share some food and that stuff. That's a great suggestion. Okay. That is that's important that's, to share. What did you What did you say, Tayden? We could donate. Yes, we have so much we could donate. What else? No waste. And no waste. <laughs> Donating and no waste. Those are no excellent waste. suggestions. No waste. Bozeman, I'm going to move to you because we're going. I want to make sure that we have time for questions from everybody. So go ahead, Bozeman. Sure. Hi. Well, my personal opinion is if we can educate the world, then we can, like, people will know more about the causes and effects of throwing a plastic bag out the window. Or in some countries, that doesn't even happen. So if we can, like, it's going to be really hard in third world countries to educate everyone on the problems we have. But if we can try to start doing that, and I don't know how we would do that with, like, putting funding into different programs. But I really think that's the way the world needs to move if we want to stop climate change or any of the bad environmental things that are happening. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> Chinook, how about, how about you? I, um, like, instead of using factories like energy power like they are now, like the way they're powered now, we can use solar power, wind power to make them more efficient and, well, yeah. Right. Good. Alternative energy. All right. Um, Dixon says that people should be held accountable, so more accountability for, for things. Okay. Yes. All right. Would you like to uh, Just a very quick response. Yeah. Um, one of you said that education is important. Bear in mind that most people in the third world countries have very poor access to education. One of the great levelers in America was the fact that every kid ultimately could get an education. And that's why you're in a position to realize these global problems. So your point is a very good one. Let's educate as fast as we can all the kids in the developing countries. Yet another one you've mentioned is efficiency. Yes, we can use various things, but if we can use them more efficiently, we're going to use less of them. Now, here's a final one. I've said that in the wildlife clubs of Kenya, we had kids going out to areas enjoying wildlife. There are now six million kids in Kenya who've been through the wildlife clubs of Kenya. What if you formed wildlife clubs or conservation clubs in North America, and you had a network discussing these issues directly with them. Then you would understand what their problems are and needs are, and they would understand what solutions you have to offer. So I'm really keen to see this connection between school kids in North America and school kids in Africa and other places. Hmm. We're going to go for a round of questions before, um, it's, before our time is up today. And so I'd like you all to think about some different questions for Dr. Western. Um, I'm going to have each school ask three questions to start with. Um, so have those ready. Because I can see Chinook right now, would you like to go ahead and I'd start? Like yeah. Okay, we have one, um, maybe two. Thanks. <laughs> Wonderful. How can we um, influence other countries and expect? certain things of other countries when we're not really leading by example, especially with when we pulled out of the Paris Agreement and with the rolling back on so many environmental protections, um, how could we um, like maybe create a better um, like image for America even with what's going on? I lost that one, but I think I got enough of it to really respond. Uh, how can America help with these big global issues like climate warming if it pulls out of the climate, Paris Climate Accord, correct? So what has happened as a result in North America I think is very inspiring. The cities, New York, Los Angeles, all the big cities are getting together and the mayors of those cities are getting together and said, you know, most of the population in North America is in cities. We are the ones who suffer pollution first and foremost. Therefore, it's incumbent on us to clean up our environment. Now, here's the good news story. Back in the 1960s and 70s, there was 
nitrogen oxide pollution all over America. People were wearing masks in Los Angeles when I first went there in 1973 because there was so much pollution. Today that's down 90%. So I see a major role for North America, not so much at this national level, but in successful cities where most of you live, to link up and to tee up with the third world cities like Nairobi, because we don't want to repeat the same mistakes. So we have a lot to learn from you about how cities, how mayors, and how all of those have been able to curb pollution in North America. So I think there's, if you like, a much more horizontal way of doing it, city to city, people to people, than this parachuting top-down approach that might work in the long run, but it's going to be very slow to happen. Bozeman, do you have another question? Oh, we do. Wonderful. Yeah, it works better. Okay. Okay. Um, so I know that a large part of what's influencing the environment is due to um, industrialized agriculture. So what are your opinions on consumer culture and industrialized agriculture and the effects of that? Yeah, obviously the amount of fertilizer, the amount of insecticide that's putting, being put onto farms today is unsustainable. Now take China as an example. There's been so much fertilizer and insecticide that about a third of the entire land is now not usable for agriculture. And China's going to have to invest something in the region of $300 billion to restore those lands. So the trick is how to use fertilizer more efficiently, how to use insecticide more efficiently, and there are, there are various technological techniques to being able to do that. But there's also technology which is going to come into it. There's the ability of these tailoring gene mechanisms to actually incorporate nitrogen fixation into, for example, cereal crops like wheat and maize and so on and so forth. So I see it as a combination of using the resources more efficiently on the one hand, but also moving ahead and using really sophisticated technology which will bypass a lot of the pollution that comes from insecticides and so on. Good question. Do you have and one? then again, sorry. sorry, one final thing. Mm -hmm. A third of all the food in the U.S. goes to waste. One third of all that food. When you go into a restaurant, where does all that food go? It cannot be used by other people. It goes to pig squeal and so on and so forth. Is there a way that you can cut down that waste? Is there a way that you can reprocess that waste and make it available to other people who don't have your advantage? That's another one. Good. Bozeman, do you have a final question for Dr. Western? Yes, they do. Okay, oh, go. Uh, so, oh, <laughs> do Go I ahead, Bozeman has one more question. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, you said like, how can we make the rest of the world live like America? Like, that's. Do you think that's possible? Because you said America uses twenty five percent of the resources, and we only have five percent of the people. That's just like not possible. Like. Obviously, we use weight, like, more than our share, technically, but, like, you know, we use so, like, nobody, not everybody in the world could live our lifestyle, like, they're just, it's not, it doesn't exist, there's not enough resources on the planet. So, like, do you think, I mean, what do you, uh, I don't even really know, I mean, do you think that is a possibility, like, or will we just have to cut back our lifestyle quite a bit to make everyone else's a little bit better? Uh, no, I don't think so. Bear in mind, the rest of the world wants to catch up with America, whether we like it or not. They, they would like all the opportunities you have. But what they can't do, and this is the point that I made earlier, is to do it in the same way that you did during your Industrial Revolution, which is to use all your forests and your soils and everything else. They've got to do it in a different way. And, for example, in Kenya, we have abundant solar power, wind power, geothermal power, hydropower, and so on. So we're saying that by 2030, we want a post-oil economy. It's too expensive for us to import Middle East oil. So we want to go the next step. But again, this is where you come in. I spend three months a year in California. California is very progressive, increasing the efficiency with which they're using resources, high technology. 
we would like to use that transfer of very efficient transfer, uh, technologies back to Africa and then make the transition to a post-oil economy. So you're going to have to grapple with those two things. You cannot and should not stop the rest of the world enjoying the benefits that you as Americans enjoy today. Surely that's the right of every person, but not in the same way. So that's your challenge. Mm. How to find another way of achieving the benefits you have without destroying the environment, without all these social inequity. That's going to be the big challenge. Thank you. I have a question from Florence uh, Carlton by a student by the name of Kipley. And Kipley's wondering about Wi-Fi in Africa and the availability of it. You mentioned that the Maasai all have cell phones. Um, their class is learning about the Amazon, and there's very little Wi-Fi in, in the Amazon. And across the state of Montana, we certainly have large swaths of land where it's hard to get Wi-Fi. Right. So what's it, li what's it like in, in Africa? Let me give you a very good example. <clears throat> there are 40 million people in Kenya, and when there are only landlines, there are only 300,000 landlines. Today, there are 30 million cell phones in the hands of Kenya. They have leapfrogged ahead of you. Look, I'm going to show you my cell phone again. I have digital money on this called M-Pesa in Kenya. Kenya developed digital money. I can go into any store and I can buy in Kenya with that digital money. I can transfer this money here in the world. If someone in town wants to transfer his monthly wages back to the rural area, he doesn't have to do what he did many years ago, get on a bus with money in his pocket and risk getting robbed. He can sus, dial and pesa and mail it back to his family in the rural areas. Kenya has gone way, way ahead of the US in the use of cell phones. Why? Because there are no landlines in between. We had to do that out of necessity. So I'm very optimistic. And this cell phone has actually increased our economic growth by about 3% through those communications. So in a way, in that sort of way, because we didn't have the advantage of your technology, we've had to leap over the old industrial economy to this new information technology. Mm. Chinook, I saw that you had a student standing and ready to ask some questions. There you are. Uh, Go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, wait, well, OK. Uh, <laughs> um, if, if we go to, like, like water powered and stuff, like wind power. I want a lot of people lose their jobs from like power companies. Um, would a lot of people lose their jobs? No, I think because if you look at oil as a form of energy, it's very concentrated. Most of that oil is coming from outside the United States. And even within the US, it's located in very small areas. But if you are gonna generate wind power, you're gonna generate solar power, you can generate it in your own house. So in fact, it's going to distribute the opportunities for green technology a mo lot more widely than the old oil industries. Okay. It'll create many more jobs than otherwise. Wonderful. Let's see, I see somebody else coming up for a question. Oh, Whoa, two, a duo. two people. <laughs> oh, I think you muted your microphone. Have to unmute again. Okay, there you go. Okay. Do you think social media is improving and encouraging people to help animals or making it worse? I, I think it's improving enormously because look, I, I was silent in getting my message out before. Nowadays I can put a camera trap on a water hole and show those animals coming down to that water hole to all of you. Let me give you another example. Cincinnati Zoo comes out to Kenya every year bringing students out. They get very excited about those animals. They are now transmitting their safari story, and I'm going to use the word safari again, back to all of their membership in the Cincinnati Zoo. The social media is a wonderful thing. It allows you to enjoy wildlife in your home, and it allows the people who are living with wildlife to get that message out to you. Good question. Did you have one other question, Chinook? Oh, yep. Here we go. If businesses wanted to convert to um, better energy, how long would it take like, for 
solar power, energy, or wind energy? How long would it take to convert? I think most people are of the opinion that it will take about 30 years to go to a majority of renewable energy. So there's going to have to be some step in between where we still rely on we still rely on oil technology, we still rely on nuclear perhaps, but even there we can use fossil fuels more efficiently. So no one that I know who is very well versed in this transition believes it can be done overnight. But on the other hand, in the developing countries again like Kenya, if we haven't already got that deep dependence on oil, we can make that transition very quickly. And in our case, we reckon we can make it within 10 years, whereas you'll probably make it in about 30 years. Thank you for those questions. Cupink, I see that you have a, a friend standing up ready for some questions as well. And then, yep, this is our last round. Unfortunately, we have to go after this. Sure. <laughs> we have a yeah. busy schedule. Yeah. So go ahead, Cupink. Do you still hunt? No, I don't. You know, I gave up hunting when I was 14 years old. When I shot my first animal, I felt very sorry for that animal. But that doesn't mean to say I'm, I'm against hunting. Over much of Africa, it's the revenues from hunting that are really helping conserve wildlife. A lot of people are really against hunting. I know that here in the U.S., hunting is a very big thing. And the revenues you pay for hunting helps conserve wildlife. So, no, I'm not against hunting. But personally, it's not for me. I'm curious, how many of you hunt? Could you um, raise your hand if, you, if, your family, if your family hunts? Or if you yourself hunt? Okay, so everybody hunts. Hey, Memphis, do your question. Do yours. Oh, say the second part of your question. is. What made you change? What made me change? Um, that sable antelope I talked about, when it came up, when I was a tiny little kid and looked down at me, I saw something in its eyes which told me, you know, that's another being just like me. And I just didn't feel right about killing animals. Then when I, when I killed my first elephant, you know, elephants are huge, great animals, they're very intelligent. There was something that went out of that animal, some life that I felt very guilty about. That's my personal thing. So it's emotional. Some people get a thrill out of hunting, they love to be on the trail, but almost every hunter I know, and I grew up with some of the great hunters in Africa, when they actually kill that animal and that animal goes down, there's always that sense of sorrow and loss. So it's really an emotional thing. There's both the thrill of hunting on the one hand, but then on the other hand, there's that sort of sorrow when you've taken that animal down. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Was it? Did your you have dad, to this way. This way. Did your dad encourage you to hunt, or was it your choice to hunt? Um, my dad. You know, he was a he was a great hunter. He loved to hunt, and he hunted elephants and rhinos and lions and all the rest of it. And it was a great big thrill. And when you're a kid, and particularly when you go on the the trail in Africa with African hunters and so on, it's it's really a great great big thrill. Mm -hmm. So it was my father who introduced me to hunting. And that's the case for most people who hunt, I think. It is a family thing. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. Okay. Thank you. I think they yeah. would, could sit and probably talk and ask questions all, right. all day long. But thank you so much for joining us. I know a couple of our other schools had to, their class was ending, so they had to pop off. But thank you for participating. And again, thank you very much. Thank you very Goodbye, much. everyone.